Inside Texas Politics, 3rd Edition by Brandon Roddinghouse, Gov Texas Government, 2306, Chapter 9, Part 1. Rushed to the hospital during a heart attack, Drew Calver, Austin father of two, recovered only to be shocked again by the sticker price of his treatment, 108951 Such surprise medical bills are not uncommon among those who find themselves out of their coverage network. Consumer advocates have been urging lawmakers to act for years. In 2019, bipartisan supporters in the Texas Senate and the entire Texas House agreed on legislation that requires health care providers like hospitals and insurance companies to arbitrate excessive bills <clears throat> to arrive at a reasonable payment for the consumer. Such arbitration slashed Calvers bill to $332, making it one of the strongest protections in the country. For Texans to take advantage of this new law, the bureaucracy must write rule, the rules that implement and enforce the new law. The Texas Medical Board, which is run by phys physicians and regulates doctors in the state, proposed rules to expand a narrow exception, which allowed for arbitration rights to be waived for scheduled surgeries with written notices to patients. One provider charged the rule misinterprets the, the law in intent, the law's intent. An angry Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick announced that he was not happy to learn that the bureaucracy had created a loophole in the law. In fighting weakens and al an already weak executive branch, but it's inevitable result of the plural executive. The Texas Constitution deliberately fragments political power and policy management so that no single individual group or agency has the power to control the government. The people elect the most <clears throat> powerful officers of the executive branch, including the Lieutenant Governor, the Attorney General, the Con Comptroller of Public Accounts, the Land Commissioner, and positions on dozens of boards and commissions that shape the policy direction of the state. The governor does not appoint them, most of them and has no direct authority over them. Designed to prevent any one individual in the executive branch from acquiring too much power, the plural executive system can lead only to slow, inefficient government, but also to outright wastefulness as officials use their power to in, engage in fighting. How serious a problem is this? Is there a solution? To answer these questions, we must learn more about the executive branch, the plural executive, and the bureaucracy, the thousands of unelected individuals, bureaucrats, whom they oversee and who establish and enforce rules. In, this, in the sections that follow, we identify that what a bureaucracy is, what it does, and how it is held accountable. The roles of the plural executive and the bureaucracy have changed as the state has grown and we chart the political implications of this expansion. 9.1, bureaucracy in Texas. The largest but often most obscure level of the executive branch in Texas is made up of the agencies and individuals who make and enforce the rules that governs all, us all. This branch of the government directly touches all our lives, whether we know it or not. Take student financial aid. More than 855,000 Texas College University students are in financial aid, and they received more than two, more than $9.7 billion in 2018 alone. The Texas Higher Education Coordination Coordinating Board Part of the Texas bureaucracy sets the rules for financial aid and the Texas Education Agency, also part of the bureaucracy, collaborates with other agencies to use financial aid to increase enrollments, help students succeed, and achieve equality of opportunity. Even when you graduate, the Texas bureaucracy continues to touch your life. Did you graduate from a hairstyling school? Texas regulates health and safety standards for barber shops who establish 
for barber shops and establishes who can be certified to cut or shampoo hair or to own a salon. The state agencies that administer financial assistance to college students and that regulate standards of the state's hair and hair, nail, and beauty salons are all part of the bureaucracy. Bureaucracy set up a hierarchical chain of command. Employees at each level report to a single boss. The legislator or governor assigns each agency its own specialized mission, such as dispensing financial aid or regulating cosmetology standards. As a result, the bureaucrats, bureaucrats in the, these agencies have knowledge or of or experience in a single area related to their mission. The size of Texas bureaucracy. Bureaucracy need to staff need staff to operate because of the size of the landmass, the number of businesses, the number of people, and the enormity of the economy. The executive bureaucracy in Texas is necessarily huge when compared to other states. However, Texas has fewer bureaucracy bureaucrats per person, approximately one bureaucrat for every 3,500 Texas residents. See figure 9.1. Still more than 7,800 people work for the Texas executive agencies, boards, and commissions that conduct most of the work in state government. Although it is comparatively smaller per person than most other states, the bureaucracy in Texas has expanded greatly since the early days of the statehood. A growing population means more taxpayers, more driver's license, and more public st school students. The bureaucracy administers to a growing population and must keep up with it. Likewise, Texas economy has grown more diverse and larger. Texas now has agriculture, <clears throat> has more agricultural products, more types of energy production, more techn technology firms, and hundreds in hundreds more industry. The bureaucracy keeps track of these industries and oversees compliance with rules and regulations. So although Texans generally dislike big government, the size of the bureaucracy reflects the services required by diverse modern economy. What the Texas bureaucracy does the bureaucracy often gets a bad rap. Politicians engage in bureaucracy bashing as a foil for their inability to make government work for their, to their liking. Reporters often highlight the worst abuses such as den the denial of workers' compensation claims to hold the government responsible. But these events may be isolated events. Texans complain about red tape or hassles of simple procedures such as renewing a driver's license or obtaining vehicle inspections. But in reality, the bureaucracy in Texas, while imperfect, performs a wide variety of vital tasks. Policy implementation. Bureau bureaucrats engage in implementation when they carry out laws and decisions made by the legislative, executive, or judicial branch. As of 2019, Texas has a new industry, oyster farming, with the near collapse of the oysters population after Hurricane Harvey, the legislator reversed its decision to restrict oyster, oyster harvesting to natural reefs. The newly constructed farms are expected to help prevent coastal erosion, filter seawater, and protect wildlife. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is now implementing rules for these building, these budding oyster farms and setting consumer safety standards. <coughs> Excuse me. Rule making. The legislator or the governor may establish a broad policy with broad goals, but bureaucrats create rules to make such, make sure that specific targets <coughs> are met. For example, the Texas Racing Commission created its own rules when it tried to expand a historic racing in Texas. Historic racing used, used video of the past, of past races with the dates and names removed and allowed individuals to gamble on the results. The Texas Racing Commission established rules that allowed the racing industry to make money from the practice. 
However, the ruling did not sit well with socially conservative Texans who opposed gambling. The legislators led by prominent school social con conservatives, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Senator Jane, Jane Nelson, objected that only the legislator could decide what was technically gambling under pressure from the legislator that included threatening to kill the agency's budget to the commission voted to repeal the, the rule. Regulation. Bureaucrats regulate industry, business individuals, and other parts of government. Regulations are often used to protect people. For example, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality uses environmental regulations to minimize air pollution. Regulations also extend to projects that enrich communities, such as the guidelines for preserving preservation of statewide historic sites issued by the Texas Historical Commission. Some Texans think that think the regulations are excessive and can hurt businesses and individuals. Case in point, Anita and Jim McHaney bought a small farm outside of Hearn, Texas. As part of their retirement, they plan to harvest, pickle, and sell vegetables that grew well on their land, especially beets, carrots, and okra until they learned of the Texas Department of State Health Services regulations. These regulations narrowly defined pickles as pickled cucumbers. Producers of other pickled vegetables had to meet stricter regulations, installing a commercial kitchen, obtaining a license, and completing a course that cost hundreds of dollars. Legislators changed the law in 1999 to broaden the definition of, briny, of the briny goods. By that time, the McHaney had fame had farm had lain fallow for several years. Licensing, licensing gives a company, an individual, or an organization permission to carry out a specific task. For instance, if you want to sell gasoline, market a Texas-made item, sell plants, or cut flowers in the Lone Star State you'll need a license from the Texas Department of Agriculture. If you want to become a teacher in one or more of than 8,000 public schools in the state, the Texas Education Agency sets out a criterion to become a certified educator. Opponents of big government argue that licensing leads to overregulation on average. Texans must complete 341 days of training pass two exams, and pay $253 in fees to become licensed. In 2017, Governor Abbott signed legislation to relax licensing requirements for shampooing and defined eyebrow threading as neither barbering nor cosmetology. Enforcement. The power of enforcement of rules uh, falls to bureaucratic entities in this state. If rules are broken, the bureaucratic agencies can investigate, issue warnings, levy fines, or even refer to criminal activity to the court system. The Texas Department of Agriculture, the TDA, launched Operation Maverick in 2015 to enforce the requirement that barbecue joint scales be certified and registered. This requirement ensures that a purchased pound of meat is in fact a pound of meat. Pushback from some of the state's most famous barbecue joints in 2017 resulted in the barbecue bill, which exempted restaurants with food sold for immediate consumption from the regulation. The TDA interpreted the wording of the bill by adding on the premises, which no longer exempted barbecue joints that sold food to go. Despite legislative adomination, to lead the establishments along with yogurt shops alone with the agency continues to issue fines. The structure of Texas bureaucracy. There are four broad types of bureaucracies in Texas. All of these entities perform similar types of functions, but each is unique in how the key personnel are selected. These organizations provide the governor and other players in the state plural executive, a way to control or not control the actions of these bureaucratic organizations. 
These types of agencies are as followed. Agencies headed by officials appointed by the governor. Agencies headed by officials independently elected by the people outside of the governor's control. Boards and commissions headed by multi-member governor appointed official. Hybrid agencies with a mix of elected and appointed officials headed by an appointed or elected board or commission. The plural executive limits the the governor's influence over the bureaucracy, see figure 9.2. As mentioned, the governor appoints some employees within the bureaucracy, particularly upper level management, but most of them are hired by management and perform administrative roles. Most positions are not politically appointed. These bureaucrats can remain in their posts even as political officials move in and out of office. Although low pay and better benefits elsewhere lead to 19.3% of state agency employees leaving their jobs in 2018, the large number of hired bureaucrats, however, has led to some argument that the bureaucracy is the last responsive branch of the government. As the people vote for the governor and other leaders of the plural executive but not as many, not the many bureaucrats who devise the rules and regulations. Governors do influence agency action. However, some governors require strict loyalty as repayment for, the, for appointment, while others are more hands-off. The governor has the least influence over independently elected officers. And so we turn our discussion to these rivals for political power. 9.2 independently elected officers <clears throat> every four years the citizens of texas elect range of important executive branch officials the most powerful of these officers is the lieutenant governor whose influence rivals the governor's but neither the com comptroller attorney general nor commissioners of agriculture and the general land office is beholden to the governor for their position so they have a sizable degree of autonomy and an ability to stir up trouble, like an armadillo in a garden if they so desire. The Lieutenant Governor. Unlike Lieutenant Governors in other states and unlike the U.S. Vice President, the Texas Lieutenant Governor plays a formidable role within both the executive and legislative branches. See figure 9.3. The duties are primarily managerial, but this responsibility makes the lieutenant governor the most powerful force in state government on paper. When Governor George W. Bush, a Republican, asked one of his consultants why he had a Bob Bullock for lieutenant governor bumper sticker on his car instead of a Bush for governor sticker, the consultant noted you don't understand, Governor, everyone in Texas works for Bullock. <clears throat> Since the end of the World War II, the Lieutenant Governor has had a significant say in the administration of the state and lawmaking in Texas. The Lieutenant Governor serves as the presiding officer of the Texas, state, uh, Texas Senate and so is in charge of administration administrative and procedural duties of the chamber. Lieutenant governors serve for four year terms with no term limits and tend to stay longer in office than other elected officials, increasing their influence. Since 1894, most lieutenant governors have served more than one term. Ben Ramsey holds the record for at six consecutive terms. Lieutenant governors frequently have stepped down only after significant controversies. See Table 9.1. The lieutenant governor must be at least 30 years old, a U.S. citizen, and a Texas resident for more than five years prior to the election. Because it is such an insider position, candidates for lieutenant governor tend to be politically connected and experienced. One exception was William Hobby Sr., who was elected in 1915, only being asked to run. A surprised Hobby, who had no political experience, replied, why can't, 
why I can't tie a string, crab it. I don't even know, own a swallow-tailed coat, and my hair just won't seem to grow down the back of my neck. Hobby would go on to be elected governor. His son would serve as lieutenant governor, and his grandson would serve as a member of the Texas Ethics Commission. A closer look at the duties at the officer office shows how the lieutenant governor has a foot in both legislative and executive branches, both making exec, execute, executing the laws. The combination is why this position is so powerful, working with the governor. As we saw in the previous chapters, chapter, governors often re must rely on the lieutenant governors to advance their agendas. Republican Governor George W. Bush made friends with the normally prickly Democratic Lieutenant Governor Bob Bullock, known to be as tough and as subordinate as on fellow politicians. Bush's fondness for nicknames extended to the Lieutenant Governor, whom he called Bully, during his first year as governor and on his signature issue of tort reform. Bush looked to Bullock to govern over a fragile coalition of Democrats in the Senate. Lobbyists tried to convince Bush to lower the ceiling on damages, but Bush stood by the compromise position that he and Bullock had reached. The governor could have threatened a veto, but he wisely chose not to turn his back on a key ally. When working together, jocular Bush would sometimes ask a Bullock, you gonna get mad at me today, bully? Appointments to Senate committees. <clears throat> the Lieutenant Governor <clears throat> is charged with appointing the legislative chairpersons and members of standing committees in the Texas Senate. This power combined with the authority to dictate the flow of legislation is a potent we weapon on in agenda control. Most Lieutenant Governors appoint some sympathetic partisans to promote their party's agenda. However, Lieutenant Governor Ben Barnes, a bridge builder across the liberal and conservative wings of the Democratic Party in the 1960s, did something no Lieutenant Governor had done before. He appointed a senator from the opposite wing of his party to serve on the, on the powerful Senate Finance Committee. Conservative Democrats how? What the devil are you doing? But the play was tragic. The appointed senator reported being too busy to make trouble. When necessary, the lieutenant governor can also set up a new standing com committee or a special committee to investigate or review issues or policies. Managing the Senate. As the leader of the Texas Senate, the, the lieutenant governor has discretion in following the chamber's rules in proper parliamentary procedures, such as deciding when a bill will come up for a vote, when to allow a senator on the floor to speak, or how to deal with points or order objections made to bill to a bill. One concern for the lieutenant governor is the contentious bill bills with dozens of potential amendments will stall Senate business and eat up too. Much precious time in a legislative <clears throat> session that lasts only 140 days, potentially killing many others, other important but non-controversial bills. While freshman Senator David Sibley attended a session in which Lieutenant Governor Bullock was machine gun gaveling one bill after another to passage in order to move the process along, Sibley asked to be recognized to complain that the Senate had not had a chance to study or debate the legislation then legislation being approved after several such attempts bullock resentfully re relented the chair recognizes the crybaby from waco he bellowed lieutenant governors adopt different management styles bob bullock represented the firm hand method using rewards old-fashioned threats and sometimes name calling to get the job done. On the other hand, Bill Hobby embodied the light touch method, 
pushing for non-dramatic consensus on legislation, Dan Patrick followed Bullock's lead when he removed Republican Senator, Senator Keel Seligal as chair, Seliger as chair of the Senate High Education Committee. Seliger com complained publicly that Patrick was punishing him for refusing to embrace the, what the Senate had called the lieutenant's governor's pet projects of bathroom regulations and private school vouchers. When Patrick spokesper spokeswoman Sherry Sylvester then threatened his chairmanship of the Agricultural Committee, Seliger co commented that he had been he had a recommendation regarding her lips and my back end. Patrick referencing for the lewd comment made good on Sylvester's threat. Later in the session, Patrick refused to recognize Seliger to bring up a vote on a bill that would save four nuclear waste facilities in Seliger's district, directing the flow of legislation. As a presiding officer in the Texas Senate, the lieutenant governor has primary responsibility for where legislation goes, referring bills to one of the standing committees. In effect, the lieutenant governor is the traffic cop for moving legislation within and through the Senate, knowing which committees might favor or disfavor a certain kind of legislation in the lieutenant governor, can promote or kill specific legislation by manipulating which committee takes first crack at the bill, at a bill. Lieutenant Governor Ben Ramsey had an encyclopedic memory for Senate rules and a deep sense of tradition in the, cha in the chamber. If he opposed a piece of legislation, Ramsey would often tell his chief aide to lose a bill. When it came time for the, a Senate's bill to be addressed, the bill would be missing on purpose. In other instances, Ramsey referred to a bill to the Committee on Sit by tossing it into his desk drawer, effectively killing the bill's chances to be heard. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick used a priority bill preferences and procedural acumen to fast track his and Governor Abbott's agenda during the 2019 regular session to advance reforms of the state's property tax and public education funding system. Tiebacking vote in the Senate. Similar to the Vice President of the United States, the Lieutenant Governor has a tie-breaking vote in the state Senate. If the chamber is evenly divided in a close vote and on the tort claim, Act in 1969, waiving immunity for the government in civil lawsuits. The Senate tied 15-15 with one member skipping the vote. Lieutenant Governor Ben Barnes, a member of the moderate conservative wing of the Democratic Party, unexpectedly voted for the act, shocking those in the gallery, including a lobbyist for the Texas Municipal League, who, mouth wide open, dropped the pipe he was smoking onto the Senate floor, burning a hole in the carpet. Membership on key legislation boards. The Lieutenant Governor serves chair, serves as chair or as a member of several key boards that govern the state, including Legislative Budget Board, the Legislative Council, and the Legislative Redistricting Board. The Lieutenant Governor shares point appointment power with governor on most of these boards, making cooperation essential to the efficient, essential to efficient government, involving Texans in the lawmaking process. Like governors, lieutenant governors are also form policy networks to help develop legislation. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick created six citizen committees, including 55 Texas business leader to advise him on legislation and policy matters affecting Texas, transportation, water, energy, and the economy. Attorney General. The Attorney General is the state's, law, state's lawyer defending the laws and constitution of Texas by representing the state in court. 
The AG provides legal services to the governor, state agencies, and local and state government entities. The AG's actions and opinions can actively shape state policy when requested. The AG's office files suit on behalf of state agencies in court. The Texas Constitution does not specify that the AG be licensed be a licensed attorney only that the AG rest represents the state in various legal capacities. In the 1970s, for instance, Texans found themselves vulnerable to every manner of consum consumer fraud, negligent nursing home owners, con artists selling phony oil investments, and retailers advertising everyday prices as sale prices. After a series of banking scandals swept the state of Swept the state, A.G. John Hill sat down with his staff at the Tex-Mex re restaurant in Austin and came up with a bill that would give legal recourse to swindle Texans with small dollar claims as they scribbled guidelines for how to deal with the deceptive practices. They spilled chili con queso and salsa picante on their, onto their papers. That queso stained plea for help for Texas consumers formed the basis of the legislation that empower, empowered consumers with courthouse access. The office's legal duties have spread into other areas as well. The AG's offices enforce health safety and consumer regulations and protect the rights of the elderly and disabled. The AG's office investigates deceptive business practices, including car repair fraud, telemarketing scams, identity theft, diploma mills, healthcare fraud, price gorging, gouging, and other consumer-related complaints. The AG is also responsible for enforcement of child support payments, including lo locating absent parents, establishing paternity, reviewing and adjust adjusting child support payments, and collecting and distributing child support payments. The AG's office can also punish parents who are behind on their child support payments by blocking car registration renewal, revoking a driver's license, or stripping a professional license. The office collected a nationwide high $4.3 billion in child support in 2018 as a result of their constitutional role Lawyers from the AG's office spend a lot of time in court. These cases fall into three categories, antitrust, consumer protection, and environmental. Cases are often filed against the federal government to challenge or provoke a review of specific federal laws or regulations. Another important function of the AG's office is to issue legal opinions to the governor heads of the state agencies, lawmakers, and local officials. See figure 9.4. The courts view these opinions as so high, highly persuasive that the AG, in effect, makes policy by interpreting a statute, a statute, rule, or law that may serve as a basis for future legislative action. See table 9.2. The power of the AG to interpret the con Constitution is second only to that of the Texas Supreme Court. The AG often wades in a tenuous swampy water between the solid shore of legal representation and murky marsh of politics. Journalistic accused Republican AG John Cronowin of being too cozy with the industries he was litigating against two years into the Cronin's tenure. Journalist Paul Burka accused Cronin of settling for less than expected on a water pollution suit against a pipeline company and of endorsing favorable settlements to healthcare providers. Because it is one of the most important and high, prior off, high profile offices in the state, the AG has proven to be a good stepping stone to political advancement in recent years. The office has promoted Mark White, Governor, John Cronwin, U.S. Senator, and Greg Abbott, Governor. Com 
Comptroller of Public Accounts, sometimes referred to as the Tooth Fairy of Public Accounts for his or her silent but authoritative approach to budgeting to state comptroller is a powerful figure in Texas politics. The comptroller's role is to estimate revenue, certify budget funds, and chart state economic growth. The state's budget operates on a pay-as-you-go system. State funds spent must equal state funds received. The legislator must craft a budget that is only as big as the comptroller says it is allowed to be. The Texas Constitution requires that all appropriations bill, bills to allow spending from the legislator to be approved by the comptroller's office. Bob Bullock reinvented the comptroller's office when he was elected in 1975. When he arrived in office, everything creaked. The procedures, the equipment, the employees. Bullock established the comptroller's office as central in matters of taxes, school finance, and agency funding. He also jealously guarded state funds. One day he walked on, on into the shore, store of a delinquent liquor distributor in San Antonio and confronted him. I'm Bob Bullock. You owe me $236,000, the dealer said. Say again, and Bullock said, I'm the state comptroller and you owe the people of Texas $236,000 in sales tax you haven't paid and I'm here to collect it. The dealer laughed and said he didn't have that kind of money. Bullock retorted, I think you've got that kind of whiskey. Bullock then turned to one of his employees and ordered, start hauling the S out of here. Bullock carried off two 18-wheelers full of whiskey. The media called the trucks Bullock's Raiders. The comptroller has an early say in the amount of money that Texas spends, giving the office significant control over the pot of money the legislator has to work with. After submitting the budget, the comptroller can still give the legislator the go-ahead to spend extra money. The comptroller also certifies that Texas budget books are balanced. The fiscal power of the comptroller also may extend into the political arena. Independent-minded Republican comptroller Carol Keaton Strayhorn was a fiscal thorn in the side of Governor George W. Bush. Strayhorn reduced the previously plump revenue estimated by $700 million in 1999 forcing Governor Bush to slim down the property tax that had, he had promised voters. Misestimating this revenue can have serious ramifications for both politics and policy. In 2011, Comptroller Susan Combs overestimated tax revenue by a whopping $11.3 billion, or 14%. Expecting economic bedlam, Lawmakers cut more than $5 billion from public education, impacting the delivery of quality public education, laying off thousands of teachers, and prompting a constitutional challenge over educational quality in the state. Less disastrous errors are not uncommon. See figure 9.5. Estimates are most frequently wrong due to unexpected recessions, overestimates, overestimated tax collection, or precipitous declines in energy prices. Estimates are also required to project up to, two, to 32 months into the future, a difficult challenge for any economist. Commissioner, commissioner of the General Land Office. The land commissioner is the oldest continuously elected position in Texas history. Oversees state-owned land, including opened beaches and submerged land off of the coast of Gulf, off the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. When Texas agreed to enter the union in 1845, it negotiated to keep its public debt, but also its public lands. The land commissioner administrators these lands by leasing them and generating funds from oil and gas production. The land office, the GLO, pursues new revenue opportunities for the state. 
The GLO is investigating development, developing renewable offshore wind, solar, or geothermal energy on, on the state lands. The GLO also oversees the Permanent School Fund, whose proceeds fund public schools and the Veterans Land Board, which makes low-interest loans available to veterans and overseas state veterans, cemeteries, and skilled care facilities. Agricultural and com agricultural, ugh, can't talk today. I'm sorry. Agricultural commissioner. The agricultural commissioner oversees the Department of Agriculture, which implements agricultural laws, promotes Texas agriculture production and products, and administers school nutrition programs. The department also performs regulatory performs regulatory functions such as protecting consumers from pesticides and certifying organic products. By the simple act of buying fruit at the grocery store, the commissioner interacts with the Texas Department, Texas bureaucracy. The Department of Agriculture certifies Texas grown produce because one in every seven working Texas, Texans, 14%, works in agriculture related jobs and the economic impact of the agriculture related production exceeds $150 billion annually. The role of the department in managing agricultural issues is critical to the economic welfare to, of the state. Like all agencies, the department, department's regulatory role is limited by available funds. funds. Agricultural Commissioner Sid Miller reported in 2015 that Texas consumers are getting screwed by unscrupulous business uh, because the Department of Agriculture has been able has not been able to perform many of its regulatory functions such as checking gas pumps for accuracy, verifying that grocery store scanners work properly, and inspecting taxi cab meters to verify that people aren't being overcharged. Commissioner Milliner Miller briefed the legislator on the matter requesting more funds to take care of the backlog. State Senator Paul Battencourt Republican of Houston remarked that he had made a, a first-hand discovery of problems with the oversight of gasoline sales. I learned about this when I drove my car in and filled up 27 gallons in a on a 19-gallon tank. Plural executive feuds. Internal feud, feuding within the Texas executive branch harkens back to the first days of the state con state's constitution. Governor Pappy O'Dan O'Daniel once labeled the board of the control and the game of and fish and oyster commission giant oil oligarchies and juicy play pretties of the professional politicians. The governor laminated that the, he was unable to meet public demand for reform because his office had been stripped of the power that was given to a bureau, to the bureaucrats. Today, both agencies are defunct, but the complicated arrangement between the most powerful agent, powerful offices within the executive branch remains. The governor and the lieutenant governor should see eye to eye, especially if they are of the same party, but relations between them are not always cordial making for diverging strategies. In 2019, a racially motivated mass shooting at a Walmart in El Paso, Lieutenant Governor Patrick ticked off by social media, bullying the lack of school prayer and people not saluting the flag as possible factors in the spread of mass shootings. While Governor Abbott pointed out to mental health issues and urged Texas officials to do a better job of handling these issues. Moreover, despite the strength of the office, the Lieutenant Governor does not always win internal fights with other executive officials. One heated exchange involved Attorney General Dan Morales, anger at Lieutenant Governor Bullock's office for hiring an outside attorney to consult on redistricting matters. This was a plum assignment because it involved the power to draw legislative district lines. Bullock came irated 
by the Attorney General's insistent in, incessant complaints and physically challenged him by bumping against him with his chest and lightly backhanding him. The two were separated and the Attorney General was eventually allowed to handle the redistricting issue. This is the end of part one, chapter nine.